Uh, hello. So our next speaker is Adi Mohamedi from IPM. His talk is points on polynomial curves in small boxes, modulo and integer. Yeah. Please. Okay, many thanks for your introduction. And I'm very grateful to the organizers of this event for inviting me. And many thanks to everyone for coming to see the talk. Uh, so I will talk about a joint work with Bryce Kerr, um, as Ilhan said about points on polynomial curves um, in small boxes, mod integers. So the objective is um, you have a polynomial. And I mean, for this talk, just to simplify things, I will just focus on degree three, but really the techniques will work for uh, various degrees. And you have a box inside the Cartesian product of Z by Z. Um, the start, the um, horizontal side of R to R plus H and vertical S to S plus H. Um, I mean, the key being that the side length is H. And again, uh, for this talk, I will talk about um, elliptic curves. So you have y2 and fx degree 3 and you want to find the upper bound for the number of solutions to this with xy belonging to this box and also very importantly q is an integer and like i said um, this you will notice that this method works for general type of equation gy um, being congruent to fx with xy in the box but it is important that um, this curve gy minus fx be um, absolutely irreducible. So, um, I mean, let's assume that degree g and degree f are co prime, but uh, there, there's probably some flexibility here as well. But I, I won't go into detail here. So, known results um, over z, we have the result, the famous result of one billion and pillar from 1989. Uh, that says that if C is an absolutely irreducible plane curve, the degree D uh, greater than two, and you have some largeness condition on H as well, then they have uh, this bound on the number of uh, rational points on this curve inside this box, uh, that being H to the one on D plus D to the one. And there is a very simple example showing that this is asymptotically sharp up to this the O one. Uh, basically, just take um, the variable m going from 1 to h to the 1 on d and your points being m and m to the d. So there are h to the 1 on d um, as a lower bound. And I mean, you can sort of give variations to this as well, I mean, obviously. And uh, over um, prime fields, say, you also have a bound that follows by veil bounds that, again, as appropriate to the context of this talk, if uh, we are again considering um, elliptic curves, but again, veil bounds give something more general. Um, that the upper bound for this box is h to the two on p plus this error term big O of root p. Now, the point is, um, I mean, this is sharp for um h being i think works out to be larger than p to the three on four and gets weaker and weaker as you move down as the box gets smaller and smaller and um it becomes trivial because uh, it becomes trivial when h gets less than root p essentially uh, the point being that the trivial bound on this quantity um, is just h because if you fix one of these, the other one essentially fixes it um, up to some multiple of that comes from the degree. Um, I should also say that in the results that are in the literature, there is also a flexibility on these boxes. So it doesn't have to actually be same size. I mean, in, in the previous slides here, we said Bambiri Pila 0H to 0H. Um, I think there are results by uh, maybe Browning and Heath Brown that uh, give some flexibility here. And 
there are also results for higher dimensions. So instead of just looking at uh, these two two dimensional boxes, we can look at uh, three dimensional boxes and two uh, D curves, or um, so on. But uh, I mean, for this problem, we just stick with the boxes of the same size. And so, like I said, the question was, what happens when the side length gets less than root p? And there was a relatively recent result of Chang, Siderolo, Guerra, Fernandez, Rawlingsy, and Zumala Karagui in 2011 that showed, again, for this, they actually showed it just for these elliptic curves. So f here, again, first of all, although in this talk we will show this result for uh, arbitrary integers, they only showed it for primes p. Um, and they, they really relied on this p being a prime. And so side length, again, h, same problem as before. Uh, they showed that they showed this this matching upper bound to Bombieri and Pila, if you remember, when h is less than p to the one on eight. And they also showed some non trivial and really good results up to p to the third. Um, there are also some results relying on, so again, I mean, that, now the question becomes what happens between a third and a half. And there are some results from free analysis um, covering that. But again, I mean, we just stick to this task. So what me and Bryce Kerr showed um, was the version of the statement we just saw. First of all, we make P, we allow P to be an arbitrary integer. Um, but like I said, we, um, the method works for all degrees, but for this talk, we stick with D equals three. Um, so we're interested in this equation. And what we get is that if H is less than or equal to Q to the one on seven, we get the bound of Bombieri pillar in this modular format. But what those guys had um, was P to the A. Excuse me? Yet. Just to be clear, is that Q is that mod Q, right? Is that I didn't hear it properly. That Q that you have, it's said mod Q, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because uh, so we're number theory, so sometimes it's a chaotic number, sometimes is Z mod P, okay. So but this is Z mod Q. Yeah, mod Q. Yeah. Okay. Um okay. So yeah, we, we, we get the bombi repila um, bound for H being less than Q to the seven. And this improves, um, this improves the previous result pretty much on the entire range. It matches it for H less than P to the eighth and improves it uh, in this range. But I guess, I think the, the most important aspect is that first of all, we're allowing Q to be arbitrary integer and uh, this this also might be a subjective thing, but I think I mean uh, another high point was that our proof just significantly simplified the previous proof. Uh, the, the previous proof was a pretty case heavy proof, but ours is just two cases and just can be done in a, um, in about a page or two. And like I said, we do things a bit more generally. Uh, in the previous slide, we had y to the two being congruent to fx, fx having degree three. Um, there are other variations. The, the, the other variation that we put in the paper uh, was this one. And as h is less than q to the two on b to the two plus one, we get again the Bombi pillar uh, bound. And okay, so like I said, it's a short proof. I'll, try to quickly sort of give you the idea. Um, and so the first step is um, we want the solutions coming from a symmetric convex body. So, I mean, to make life easier for a fixed solution of this equation, we do a shift of variables so that uh, now you're looking at a poly polynomial congress e equation um, with the variables coming from um, a symmetric um, region. So instead of 
you know, some box somewhere. Uh, we, we, we take a symmetric region around the origin. So what, what happened now is that we got rid of um, the constant term and we added a, a C node Y term because, because of the shift. And secondly, note that if you let um, X being uh, the X variable solutions to this equation, it, it suffices to just bound the size of X because then the number of solutions to this equation is just 2x. Um, I do a very quick sketch just so you get the idea because when we do go into the technical details, it gets a, might get a bit messy. Um, so of course this is a polynomial equation, but let's look at it as a linear equation. Um, I mean, linear mod Q equation. So this Y2, um, this, this really had uh, two variables, but now we have turned it into five variables. So this x3 was x to the 3, x2 was x to the 2, and uh, so on. Um, this linear equation defines a lattice in z5. Now the proof has two steps. Firstly, uh, we should we find a convex body that hugely intersects this um, lattice defined by this equation. So we get a really good upper, lower bound for it. This step relies on progress on Vinogradov's mean value theorem. You may have heard about it, uh, the uh, work of um, efficient congruency by Woolley, um, then uh, using a completely different method, Borgan, Demeter, and Guth using um, the coupling theory and free analysis. Um, the method essentially was bounding some exponential sums uh, to do with the uh, question of Vinogradov and the conjecture of Vinogradov was resolved. Um, this step, the first step is actually simple, but it does use heavy machinery. Uh, the second step is now, so now we have a convex body and a lattice, and we have shown it has um, a big intersection. Now the next step is to look at the relative geometry of this lattice and the body. And um, here we, based on this geometry, uh, based on this really abstract geometry, we split into two cases and um, proceed differently based on these two cases. So the first case is this lattice fills the body really tightly, um, as in um, it sort of uniformly fits it. Uh, so basically, I just want you to get the idea that if the lattice is really tight in this body, um, we can get a really good upper bound on this uh, intersection. And this uses some results from geometry of numbers. I won't go into details in this talk. Um, and the point being that in such a case, when, when um, the, the lattice is really well behaved inside this body, we get a good upper band and we're pretty much done because we had a good lower band as well. But the point is that now let's say, I mean, when, when I say uh, fits it tightly, say you have the Euclidean ball. Um, now just um, you, in five, five dimension, let's say. Just Z5, if you look at just Z5, the lattice, we say it fits it nicely. Um, because it's a really uniform lattice and um, you can kind of get a good upper band on the number of lattice points that sit inside this Euclidean ball. Um, it's just um, essentially the volume of the um, Euclidean ball. But the observation that we made in this paper was that and, and here, the, up to here, it's the same as the previous approaches pretty much. But then the previous approaches went into a multi-case analysis, um, which I mean, I can't just say it now, but um, ours just goes into a second case and says, well, the other case is that if this lattice is not so well behaved and say it really stretches in one direction, um, then what it says is that the dual lattice is sort of well behaved now. And we can find a, um, a vector in the 
intersection between the dual lattice and the dual body. And this gives us a new equation. And what the dual, this vector does, um, I mean, we will see the definitions, but um, this vector sort of has a property that when, uh, when you look at the inner product of that vector and um, the lattice points, these all have very small inner products. These are essentially a big O of one size. These having a small inner product, this having a small size, as in we have, a, we have now a new equation where the size of this thing is very small. Instead of this C node A3, A2, A1, we have a new equation. And when you put this Y2, Y1, X3, X2, X1, you get small size. So what this says is that now we can turn this mod Q equation into an equation over Z, because then there aren't many choices. So this was a something plus uh, some N Q, right? So now this N, there are at most big O one choices for this N. And for each fixing each N, we can now use one B repeal. So they call this technique a lifting technique because we have brought our um, equation to Z now and we can use one B repeal. So, I mean, I hope you can sort of get the gesture because um, as we go into details, it does kind of um, get more technical. So definition of lattice, lattice is a discrete um, sub additive subgroup of the Euclidean space Rn. Its rank is defined by dimension of the linear space at its fans. In this talk, we will almost definitely just talk about lattices of full rank. Convex body um, is a set inside Rn. It is convex, meaning that if you take any two points, uh, the points, uh, as in the line um, connecting them stays inside the set. It's open, bounded, and we say it's symmetric if um, A is equal to minus A. The dual lattice essentially um, extends the notion of dual vector space. So um, dual vector space is just a linear set of linear functions mapping a uh, vector space to the uh, field. And here we're talking about modules over rings and we ask that, and, and there is a one-to-one, -one, when, when talking about vector spaces, there is a one-to-one -one between the vect uh, vectors and um, the linear functions given by um, the inner product. So here we do something similar and ask that uh, the set of all uh, elements of Rn so that the inner product of that those elements with all elements of Z are integers. And again, this is the Euclidean inner product. Examples, the dual of Zn is just Zn. And uh, for every scalar, um, the dual of uh, dilate of the lattice is um, the inverse of that scalar times um, the dual of the lattice. And so, for example, um, you can see if your lattice is 2z2, then the dual becomes half z2. And I mean, the point of this picture was that, um, you know, this compactness that I talked about, this tightly packedness um, is inverse with a dual lattice. So as your lattice gets more dilated and uh, less dense, the opposite happens with the um, dual lattice. The dual body is defined as, given a body, um, all elements of Rn so that the inner product is small, is less than or equal to one for all Z in that body. Um, examples, uh, the Euclidean unit ball is self-dual. Um, the if you consider the box minus one to one in two dimensions, then uh, the dual of it is just this uh, polytope uh, given by this equation, and this sort of extends to this uh, higher dimensional sort of more general box. That the dual of this, the dual body of such a box, is just um, elements x one to x n, so that the absolute value of x one times h one and so on is less than equal to one. 
this is uh, of special importance to this talk. Now, getting back to this duality with lattices and how, um, what our notion of, as in we now make it more rigorous what we mean by when a lattice is uniform and well behaved. Um, and that's done through this notion of uh, successive minima. So a success, um, so in, in a, a n-dimensional lattice in Rn has um, n successive minima, and the first one is you take your body and you keep dilating, dilating it by these scalars. From zero, you go up, up, up until you meet the first vector. And that's your first successive minimum. Um, then you go up, up, up until you um, find the second vector that is linearly independent with the first, and that's your second, and you go so on. So the definition being the infimum of such lambdas, so that gamma, the lattice intersection, its intersection with the dilate of the body, um, as in the smallest dilate, so that it contains I linearly independent points. I will show a picture, it makes it a little clearer. So certainly you have lambda one being less than lambda two and so on. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's these successive minimas are a measure of how stretched the body. So if, you're, if your lattice was just Zn and your body was a Euclidean ball, all successive minimas would be one, right? Uh, so it, we call it not so stretched, but you know you could also have lattices that one of the vectors just suddenly appears, um, you know, forever down the line. And again, lattices being well behaved makes life easier for us. Lattices not being well behaved, um, then we can say something nice about the dual lattice. Um, so the picture uh, here we talking about Euclidean ball, some random lattice. So we moved from, we kept dilating from the origin and we hit the first vector. That's our first um, minimum. And then we kept going and that's our second and probably the third would be maybe this one. And um, based on this dichotomy now, so like, like we said, if the biggest uh, successive minimum is really small, um, we have a nice behaved, nice relative geometry of lattice and, um, and the convex body. And here, Minkowski's second theorem, um, a corollary of it is that we have a good upper bound on intersection of the lattice and the body. And it turns out to be the volume of the convex body over Rn mod gamma. The gamma that we will be looking at will have, um, you know, the mod Q equation. So this thing will just end up being Q. Um, so that happens if lambda n is less than one. Don't take this inequality too seriously. It can there can be a constant here that doesn't affect our purposes. The other duality happens if lambda n is large. If that happens, like I said, there are results that tell us that, okay, now um, the first successive minimum of the dual body, um, the dual lattice um, with respect to the dual body is small. So here it gives us a vector um, in this. I mean, the, the entire point is that we will find a vector that when that has very small inner product um, with all the elements of our original lattice and body. So this is the duality that we'll rely on. Now, um, now that, I mean, you have some vague idea of the geometry of numbers that we'll use. We go into the first step of the proof, uh, which will use the progress on Vinogradov's mean value theorem. Um, it says that if you have such equations, so first of all, um, take some k, fix some k. Um, so that means that the, this equation will go x1 to xs to xs plus 1 to x2s. And then 
higher powers up to k. So these j's, the powers, they keep going up and up. And then having fixed your k, um, then there is this constraint on s, how, how many variables you can have. And uh, whether these constraints on s is sharp or not, I doubt it, but this is the this is the limit of the approach that Vinogrado set out using these estimates of exponential sums. And it was Borgen, Demeter, and Guth and Woolley using completely different methods that uh, result this conjecture. And what this result says is that the number of solutions to such equations can pretty much just be the trivial ones. So if you take x1 to xs and you just copy paste it here, these give you x to the x solutions, right? So what the what they have proved and what the conjecture said was that the, the number of solutions, even if you add these extra variables, doesn't really change it, just by factor of x to the little one. We will especially be interested in this for powers of three, so we will fix k to be three. This will allow s to go to six so three times four on two and it will give the solutions to these equations being um chi to the six um yeah chi to the six so as in x1 to x6 x7 to x12 then the next power of the same equation then power three of the same equation so like i said the corollary that we'll use is this something um, particularly that i've done is that um so here we had one to h but it's easy to see that these these solutions are in invariants on the shifts of the variables and so we just again for our purposes this is more convenient to have minus h to h okay now we can start the proof um Define these intervals minus six h to the j, uh, j being one to three, to six h to the j. Again, this is a symmetric convex body, uh, the the Cartesian product of them. And remember, this chi was solutions from our polynomial original polynomial equation. So for each each x y was something that solved our um, equation that we originally had. Now consider these three tuples that we form out of this. As we run through these solutions to that polynomial we had, so x1 to x6, x1 to the 2 to x6 to the 2, and so on. So what we want to do is to find the lower bound on S. How many distinct such three tuples do we have? And by doing this, you are really um, trying to maximize the intersection between the lattice defined by that linear equation that we got from our elliptic curve with uh, this, this um, convex body. Okay, to do that, uh, write i of this x tilde for the number of um, distinct solutions to this equation. So how many such distinct treatables satisfy being equal to, uh, to some x, to some x tilde? Um, we, we will use Cauchy-Schwartz. Um, the first moment of this um, representation function is just chi to the six. This is trivial because we're asking um, how many such treatables satisfy being this for some x um, inside S. I mean, that's tri trivial that you're counting all six tuples. Now we look at the second moment of this representation function. Now this is precisely this equation. So x1 to x6 satisfying x7 to x12 uh, equaling x7 to x12. So this was resolved by Borgen, Demeter, and Guth. And it gives us again x to the six. And Cauchy Schwartz tells us, I mean, we saw this. Cauchy Schwartz tells us that 
um, this, I mean, one times this thing. Um, so we get S, which is the support of the sum times second moment. We just gave an upper bound for the second moment. We want a lower bound for size of S. And so we have at least chi to the six times uh, some small factor of three tuples lying inside this convex body, which is a Cartesian product um, I1 having length um, H, I mean, almost H, I2 having length almost H to the two, and this having length almost H to the three. Such that, uh, we, as in, we have a, a lot of solutions to this linear equation for some um, y1 in i1 and y2 in i2. So, I mean, you can kind of see, I only really focus on elliptic curves just for the simplicity of it, but nothing here you've done really restricts us to this degree. You could have done this for higher degrees of both left hand side and right hand side. So, like I said again, we just gave a lot of solutions um, to the uh, to this linear equation mod zero um, mod q, and um, yeah, I mean again, this is just repeating that if gamma is the lattice, um, remember x a one was this was our original equation was a one x to the x a two x to the two a three x to the three and so on, and the body um, being x3 less than 6 h to the 3 and so on. So this lattice and the body have a large intersection. Um, now we go to the geometry of numbers part. Again, we split into two cases. If lambda 5 is small, like we said, Minkowski gives us a good upper bound volume of D so volume of D is what? H to the three times um, two twos times two ones. So three and four, um, seven and two, nine. So H to the nine and um, this R5 mod gamma is size Q. We had a lower bound, mix it with the upper bound. We just got a bound on the number of solutions. Now, the second case is lambda 5 being greater than 1. That tells us, um, I mean, again, when I say greater than 1, it, it can really be greater than some constant, just as long as it's not greater than some power of h, let's say, as long as it's, it, it's not usually going out. So um, again, remembering our lattice on the body, we can calculate um, the shape of our um, dual lattice and the dual body. Um, I mean, I won't go through the calculations, but really the bottom line here is that um, this lattice and this body have um, um, the first successive minimum less than or equal to one or big O of one, which really tells us that there is a, we can find a vector in the intersection pretty close to the origin. And um, really that vec that single vector is really the key to what we're trying to accomplish. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the calculations, it's it just messy to sort of, it's a series of if and only if statements going from the definition of our lattice um, and using, uh, and using the definitions of the dual lattice and dual body. So, like I said, we have lambda five being greater than one implies lambda one star, the first successive minimum of the dual lattice um, in relation to the dual body being small. It gives us a vector. And this vector will give us a new equation. So, uh, we have a double WIs, so that WIs are less than Q to the H to the I's, Z1 uh, corresponding to the Y variables. And we have that AI Z2 is congruent to WI and C node Z2 is congruent to Z1, all mod Q. And now we go back to our 
original equation. If xy was a solution to our um, elliptic curve mod q, then this was a solution to the, um, as in it was, it lied inside the intersection of the lattice and the body. So, um, as in it, um, so yeah, as in it was a, it was in this intersection. Now we have a vector, um, the Euclidean uh, inner product of which with that um, lattice point is very small. So what we're really saying is that, as in this is the new equation. So we have found this Z2, Z1. This is the vector that we found, right? So we put this Y2 inside it, as in this is just, um, if you forget about this QT for now, this is just the inner product, which we say is small. So Z2 we said is um, less than Q on H2. Now Y2 is inside this box, so it's less than H to the two. So this is big O of, um, um, sorry, big O of Q. This is big O of Q. Z1, we said is less big O of Q on H. Um, y is big O of H. So this is again big O of Q. X to the three is big O of H to the three, again, because it lies in this box. W3 is big O of Q on H to the three. So this is, I'm, I mean, you, you get the story. The point is that now, now that we um, turned from a modular equation and brought this QT inside, it, this whole thing is saying that this T, there are big O one choices for this T. So fix this T. And this is an equation over Z, we can just use Bombier Pila. And you're done. I mean, for each T you use Bombier Pila, you get H to the third. And there are big O one choices for T. So that's it. The number of solutions is you go up H to the third plus little one. Um, so with this, I thank you very much. And I mean, if, if you like, I can sort of go over the details, but um, again, but really the point was that if the lattice is not, we found the lattice, a body, um, we found a large intersection between them. You look at the geometry. If um, the geometry is nice, if the lattice fits this body nicely, you get an upper band, you're done. If not, you look at the dual, you find a vector that gives you a new equation, helps you lift your modular equation over Z, you apply one view to that. And this, like I said in the paper, it was just a one or two page proof. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, so, there are any questions or comments? So let's thank our speaker Adi once more. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.